Angus, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you all uh, for coming here at 4.30, one of the, the last sessions. We'll keep it to about 45 minutes or so. But I'm very excited. We've got a great panel here this afternoon. Uh, we have Fabrizio here on my left, um, who has tremendous experience in another uh, very important emerging market, Mexico. Uh, Fabrizio was involved with the national carrier um, and now is involved with Aeromar, a regional carrier. And uh, then we have Kevin Knight, who's the chief of strategy of, at Etihad, of course, uh, the national carrier, and uh, one of the most innovative airlines in the world. And then um, at the end, we have Andre from SRT. And as we've said, one of the, the topics here is the lean uh, airline model. And lean means generally outsourcing. And of course, one of the major um, areas to outsource is the maintenance business. And uh, Andre will talk about that as we uh, go through the panel. Um, but first of all, before we start, uh, I just maybe uh, like each of the, uh, um, the panelists to say something about themselves and their business model. Maybe we could start with yourself, Fabrizio. Thank you, Angus. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, very excited to be here in, in the Middle East, in Abu Dhabi. We at Aeromar are very active in the uh, conference circuit in the Americas, North America, South America. It's our first incursion in this part of the world, so uh, we look forward to a very active participation. Uh, just a quick word on Aeromar. We are Mexico's longest operating airline. We've been in business for uh, a little more than 27 years, um, which is probably not a lot in, in calendar years, but in, in aviation terms, 27 seems to be getting pretty old now. Um, most of the airlines in Mexico, large ones, um, have had to reinvent themselves, and Aeromar being a smaller player is also part of that mode where we really have to keep looking at our business model continuously to, to remain competitive. We were born lean basically from the very beginning by, by the definition of the business model, which is to be a, a regional airline covering secondary markets with uh, turboprop aircraft. We, we currently fly 16 ATRs. We have 14 ATR-42s and uh, just introduced two ATR-72s, uh, brand new atr 72 600s. We also um, have uh, tactically introduced the CRJ-200 jets to cover part of our network. And so by, by having defined ourselves as, as a niche player in a, in a regional market, we are forced to to act and think lean all the time. This means that many of our um, staff and, and uh, departments are really uh, to the bone, I would say, where one or two people make up a single department sometimes. So when that person is away or is on vacation uh, or sick or whatever, uh, people like me have to actually step in and, and do the work for them or simply just wear multiple caps where if a certain project or a certain um, idea needs to be executed. Many times the, the person that is in front of you is actually doing the actual work and, and that's incredibly challenging but it's also a lot of fun because you're really applying all the, all the know-how and the, uh, the experience that you've acquired throughout the years in, in running the actual airline. So whether it be in, in planning or in commercial or in uh, you know, uh, check-in, whatever, you get involved to the max, and that is uh, what I, I really think makes our airline different. Uh, everybody gets involved on a day-to-day -day basis on a personal level because we're so small, we're compact, and that also creates a lot of, uh, of good chemistry and good teamwork. So in our case, we do little outsourcing, actually. We, we've recently outsourced our, our call center. Uh, everything else we do is in-house, including the MRO. Uh, we've been flying the same aircraft for about, as I said, uh, 25 plus years. So we know the aircraft inside and out. Uh, we found that we're the best qualified. We have the, boss, the best cost basis and the best experience to, to do the work. So um, our challenge, I would say, as we face larger competitors is what I call the, the speedboat effect. We, we are uh, navigating a sea of, uh, you know, of cruise ships and we're actually managing a speedboat. So we're much faster than they are. We can turn on a dime. But we also know that if a, if a wave hits us, they're going to, to turn us over and, and probably will drown. So we have to always think ahead, uh, be ahead of the competition. And that is how we've uh, managed to, to, to be in business for such a long time. So um, Mexico as an emerging market has a lot of uh, opportunity, a community of interest with, uh, with the, probably the Middle East in terms of the 
the oil, the energy business. Uh, Mexico has recently opened up to, uh, to foreign investment in, into the oil business. And we as, as Aeromar are very focused on, on covering that, that region of, of our continent, which is uh, the Gulf of Mexico, the northern part of Mexico. And so we, we've been having some discussions locally as to how uh, to interact more uh, in aviation terms with, with this part of the world. And hopefully the day will come when, when there's the technology to fly an aircraft nonstop from Mexico City, which is the largest city in the world, to Abu Dhabi and enhance the connectivity that uh, we've discussed here at length. So again, thanks for the invitation, Angus, and great. looking forward to Thank it. Thank you, Fabrizio. Kevin, you want to say a few quick words? Yeah, thanks, Angus. It's great to be here this afternoon, and thanks for all of you attending. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, represent Etihad Airways. Obviously, as the national carrier here in the UAE, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and talk to you about this particular topic. And you may be thinking, well, what is Etihad doing on a panel that's, that's talking about you know, cost effectiveness and lean? But this is the airline business. Uh, and the airline business is a very, very tough, tough business. Low margin, high fixed costs, labor intensive, hyper competitive. And so it's critical that any airline, whether you're Aeromar or, or Etihad, you have a strategy that addresses the cost structure and making sure that you're laser focused on cost and you're as efficient as possible. But I'd, I'd also add in addition to the cost side, it's also important that your strategy include top line as well. If we're going to be successful, we're going to be profitable, we're going to be able to invest and grow our airlines. We really have to focus on the top line as well, as well as the bottom line. And that's really what uh, we try to do at Etihad. And that's really where our partnership strategy comes in. You know, while we'll always be first and foremost focused on our own internal growth, it's the cornerstone of, of our strategy. What can we do as Etihad? What do we need to do to make sure we're delivering both the top line results, but also the efficiency on the cost side to deliver the bottom line results? You know, in the global scale of things, we're still a, we're still a very small airline currently at about 95 airline, uh, 95 aircraft, excuse me. You, know, you compare that to some of my global competitors, some just up the road, and I'm still in a relatively small in scale, but I have to compete on a global stage. And that's really where the partnership strategy that, that makes us a little bit different than some of our competitors comes in. Because with that partnership strategy, what I can do is I can stretch my network, I can offer my guests greater opportunities to travel not only on Etihad, but places that I can't serve either because they're not economic or because there's regulatory barriers that preclude me. So I can stretch my network to compete with larger global carriers. That's pretty common. Many alliances exist today, partnerships exist today, but what's a little bit unique is, you know, we look at partnerships not only as an opportunity to deliver that top line result, but also to deliver on the cost side as well. Again, as I said, this is, a, this is a business with a lot of fixed costs associated with it. Um, and so the challenge for us is how can we lower those costs? How can we become as efficient as we possibly can? And partnerships, again, are a way to do that because I can work with partners, okay, to take advantage of the overheads that we have, spread them across the group, things like training, things like maintenance, uh, things like procurement, you know, where we can develop scale so that we can go to the marketplace and get better rates and terms, lowering our overall costs and generating a better bottom line for the, uh, for the company. So we're a little bit unique in that respect, um, but where we're not unique is the need to focus on the bottom line, to be profitable so that we can grow and expand our business. And obviously, you know, being as lean and efficient as possible is critical to that. And so we think, you know, we've got a strategy, it's a little bit unique, but we think it's a winning strategy for the future. Great, thank you, Kevin. Andre, you have a few words to say about SRT and how you can facilitate making an airline lean um, in terms of taking over the MRO activity. So maybe first of all, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here sitting along among airlines. Uh, and I really jumped in as a sort of AOG when I heard there's an airline representative missing here as an MRO. Um, we are we're used to AOG and I'm proud to be part of this uh, panel and 
proud to be sit next to uh, my customers. But there's a bridge to airline. Um, Esther Technics originally came or was part of an airline. It was a sort of a part of the internal Technics. And I think uh, with the grounding of that original uh, company of, of airline, we've also learned a very good lesson um, that it is sometimes when complexity is too high, it's good that everybody focus on uh, the area where they're good at. And um, I believe with the transformation from an airline dependent maintenance into an absolute independent, we have learned what it means to develop economies of scale, to select, for example, inventory of many, many, many airlines and optimize it, then still provide this uh, service. And I think uh, we've, we've been able as a partner of airlines also uh, to, to contribute in a big style and make sure that uh, one of the complexity can be reduced, which is making sure the dispatch reliability, the utilization of, of these aircraft can be maintained at the highest uh, possible level. And this is also where we see an opportunity uh, in, in the future. This morning, it was a lot of talks about further consolidation and further partnership beyond uh, airlines. And I've asked you, Angus, for the leasing companies also thought about a full concept where maybe in future, airline can uh, be supported in a again, in a, in a reduced level of complexity by not op only providing the technical reliability, but also total asset availability. Great. Thank you, Andre. Um, <clears throat> well, to bring this then into the, the real meat of the discussion, Lean, um, at Aircap, um, once we complete the acquisition of ILSC, we'll have 1,700 odd airplanes. And our level of activity, to put this in context for those in the audience, we would repossess an airplane less than every three weeks. So when you think about it, that's to Kevin's point, how hard is this business? It's hard. It's tough to make money in this business when you see that kind of velocity. Every 15 days, an airline is shutting down somewhere on average, and we're taking an airplane out. Um, now, we've never run one, but we do see the same symptoms of an airline getting into trouble. Um, and we get the results of over 200 airlines around the world every quarter. And it's always the same thing. You'll see as uh, the costs, obviously, you'll see costs continue to creep. Um, and costs are well, well described to me once. They're like fingernails. They keep growing. You've got to keep cutting them. And then, of course, to Kevin's point, though, on the revenue line, you must make sure that as you add each additional airplane, that it's not actually losing money. Anyone can give away a $10 bill for $9 you've got to make sure that when you add that extra shell, that the market is there for it. And one of the other things we look at when we look at the performance of airlines is we see, we'd always ask them, how many routes did you open up in the last 12 or 24 months? It costs money to open a route. It's like a new product. You've got to spend money on it. And how, did, how many did you shut down? If you've got a big shutdown rate, then there's issues with the revenue line for sure. But you know, on the, on the cost side, of course, um, one of the obvious things that are outsourced are ownership costs through leasing and, of course, maintenance costs. But I'd be very keen to get your thoughts on, uh, on those topics, each of you, and also what other areas would you focus on for outsourcing where you think that the, benef the, risks, the benefits of ownership are, are, not as, are, are outweighed by the, sub by the benefits of subcontracting. Maybe, Fabrizio, you'd like to sure. start that. Well, clearly in our case, because of, of the scale of our company, um, we derive uh, significant advantages by doing um, sale and leaseback transactions. We're in the process of doing that right now. Um, that allows us uh, you know, to, to, to keep our fleet constant and at the same time uh, mitigate the risk of you know, uh, extending the life on, on aircraft that might uh, not be necessary in the future. So. That sort of flexibility is very helpful to us. The other thing we're doing in terms of uh, outsourcing, as, as I said, we, we just outsource our, our call center. We are looking at which layers of cost we can get rid of. For instance, uh, revenue accounting, which is very labor intensive, uh, is an area where we might be doing some outsourcing in the future. Um, we, we look always at who can do it best and, and cheaper. And we found surprisingly, because in, in Mexico, labor is relatively cheap, comparatively speaking, that most often we can do it better and cheaper ourselves. So as long as we can keep it that way, there's no incentive to outsource. But we, you always have to keep questioning and challenging yourself if there's a better alternative. 
in terms of, of, of fleet and expansion, um, and I agree 100% with you, there's nothing more expensive than trial and error. We see a lot of trial and error around us, and that is a, a, a you know, it, 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 it's a disaster in the making. If you continue to just try and try and, and fail and fail, it, it means you're doing something wrong. Unfortunately, it seems that uh, some uh, of, our, our, of our peers um, have a short memory, and so they try something that fails, and then they try it again, and then it fails, and then they keep trying it. Um, we simply avoid that model altogether. If we don't have a solid, a rock-solid business case for a new route or a new airplane, we simply don't do it. Mm -hmm. So we, are ex we test ourselves all the time in terms of profitability expectations, and we have very clear targets as to what our uh, possibilities are. You know, financially speaking, it's very expensive to, to add capacity, whether it be adding uh, metal or increasing your network. So we test it, and if it doesn't work, we don't do it. And you know, maybe uh, Kevin, just turning to you, um, if you think about the network that Etihad has created, to try and generate that organically would probably be a stratospheric sum of money. And instead, you've gone through the partnership program, which is very innovative, as a better way you view to grow the network globally, which I would say, to be quite frank, is a much more conservative strategy of growing. Um, there, and also, I would say, would be, in the long run, um, a much better value proposition, potentially. But maybe you'd like to, uh, to comment on it. Yeah, so as I said in my opening uh, comments, I mean, on a global stage, we're, we're still relatively small. Uh, and while we're growing quite quickly and have placed some fairly large aircraft orders, I mean, our, our ability to get the size and scale of some of our competitors in a short period of time is just not possible. Uh, the assets aren't available. Uh, the cost of those assets is, is prohibitive. I mean, it just doesn't, it just, it's just doesn't make any economic or, or business sense. Uh, so we had to go about our business a little bit differently. We had to develop a strategy that was a little bit different because I do have to compete with uh, carriers here in the Gulf and around the world. And so, as, as Angus said, I mean, so our, our strategy was really to, to partner with like-minded airlines so that we could enhance, increase kind of the reach of our network and do it in a, in a cost-effective way. Um, and uh, that's what we've done, and it's, it's worked quite, quite effectively for us. Uh, you know, this is, this is a business of risk as well, and all business have, have risks associated with it. But, you know, as we talk about business models and as we talk about, you know, costs uh, and, and, and doing what we need to do to drive uh, profitability, I think we also need to talk about risk. Uh, and, again, I think our partnership strategy, while not completely risk-free, is, you know, a lower risk strategy than if we were to take on all those assets and try to develop all those markets, uh, you know, in a very fast fashion. It's just it's extremely risky. Um, and so, you know, this is, a, this is also a very effective way for us to manage the risk, in some ways share the risk, you know, across, uh, across our network and across our partners' network, uh, and really go to market in a pretty, in a very effective way. Uh, and it's, uh, it's really led to the success that we're having today and the profitability we're generating today. Kevin, I mean, uh, you mentioned risk. You know, this business is all about risk and reward. And Andre, you know, from an airline's perspective, um, Airlines that have owned MRO shops in the past, some it's been very successful, some not so successful. I know myself, we, we spend four million a day on MRO in Aircap. Every single day we spend four million bucks. And I never get a good news out of an engine. I call them the sunshine parts when they're opened up. The part has to be replaced. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the risks of an airline owning an MRO, given that, as you mentioned, you were part of the Swiss Air Group uh, originally? and now you're an independent MRO, and what are the benefits for an airline of having its own MRO versus outsourcing it? Okay, first of all, I'm already always very, very impressed with airline managing the complexity they've got already. I mean, whether it's uh, at the point of aircraft sale, the leasing, uh, the financing of the whole vehicle, the whole network uh, management, the pilot training, you know, managing the, the whole fleet, and in addition, lots of suppliers, the ground handlers, and so on. And sometimes I, I struggle um, that 
even the contribution and help all the people are there was focusing only on the, on the MRO part, they still want to own that complexity and ask myself why. And it's, it's to have it in their own hand, to control it as well, to make sure the whole package uh, is, is, is under control and actually the, the fleet performance is there. So I understand all this. And um, I understand that from a risk management point of view, they need the right partner. So we had to learn that uh, lesson over the, the last decade. And we had also the opportunity, because we don't have only one airline as customer, we've got many and different types of small airlines, big airlines, low-cost carrier, uh, five-star airlines. I think it's through a period of time and demonstrating ability, the trust will come. And then uh, as an airline, uh, watching heads here, I can see also that they assess the risk much lower with a strong partner who takes it on, who can demonstrate they can do it much better. And there I see uh, lots of op opportunity, and not only to reduce complexity, uh, maintain their or mitigate uh, their risk, but also to demonstrate with lots of different airlines, you've got a total different cost setup and you can decrease cost. And I, I, I use one of my uh, uh, favorite customer who really grown significant is making good money in, in Europe, uh, a low cost carrier where we um, look after more than 200 aircrafts now grown with them and uh, where we've demonstrated the highest level of dispatch variety so the trust grown over there is just, look, you take it off our shoulders. And at the same time, if you look at their annual reports, that's public, the, the, the maintenance cost is decreasing continuously. So this is where I believe trust need to be uh, built and uh, need, need to grow, but there are opportunities out there for airline, airlines actually to reduce complexity, risk, and cost as well. Very interesting. Uh, uh, Fabrizio, I mean, I think it, we're talking about risks and lean, and I mentioned in my opening comments that you were previous with a national carrier in Mexico, Mexicana, um, who's no longer with us. I think it'd be very interesting for the panel and the audience if you could share some of your experience there as to what issues led to the demise of the airline, and uh, both on the cost and the revenue side, is, and where, where, where have you learned from that? Well, yes, um, Mexican unfortunately uh, stopped operations about three and a half years and after a very unique, I would say, bankruptcy process was finally put to rest a few days ago. Uh, it's, just, it's sad, but it's part of business, you know, it's survival of the fittest. And um, I left the company seven years ago and, and when I left, I did so because I, I, I simply thought that the company could not survive for several reasons. One. Union, um, union behavior and union mentality was simply dragging the company under. Um, a very legacy mentality of extracting as much, uh, let's say, benefits and, and money out of the company that was unrealistic given the, the degree of competition that, <coughs> I'm sorry, that was going on and that was uh, actually developing around Mexicana. Still, the unions did not realize what was going on, and that, to me, was one of the key elements. The other one was the inability to, um, to maximize the use of their assets. So, for instance, they brought in a couple of A330s uh, to fly to Europe uh, for what reasons I don't understand. I wasn't part of the team uh, then, but they were flying the aircraft about... Uh, 11, 12 hours a day when competitors were flying the aircraft, 18, 19 hours. So. Maybe for the audience's benefit, for a wide-body aircraft, you've got to be in the high teens to have any hope of making money out of it. Uh, the narrow-body airplanes, you can be at about 10 hours a day and you could do okay, but the wide-bodies, you're incinerating cash exactly. at uh, 10 or 12, 10 hours a day. Um, when the uh, housing uh, crisis hit in 2008, 2009, they decided to uh, redo the whole livery on about 80 aircraft, uh, start a new division, a low-cost division, airline within the airline called Click, and uh, change the reservation system. So when everybody else was tightening their belt, they decided to, to start spending a lot of money, and the timing of that was simply unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Again, mm -hmm. I must stress that I, I was no longer with the company at that time. But so it's interesting you made the point in our opening comments about you trial and error is not a strategy. And I guess that's something that you saw right. in Mexicana. Exactly. So what we've learned from that at Aeromar, and again, 
we being the smallest guy in town, we have to be always one step ahead. And so what we learn is you have to engage your unions, you have to engage all of your staff, whether you know, they're the flight attendants, the pilots, and make them understand that either they change or, or we're gone. Yeah. And so a lot of interaction with them, a lot of education, a lot of uh, sharing information that maybe in the past hadn't been the case. And so when you start sharing information with, with them, maybe you, you start changing their mind a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other thing we, we really uh, realized, and this hit us when uh, we had a, a huge influenza crisis in Mexico in 2009, it was. Uh, we lost 80% of our bookings overnight as soon as the, the contingency was declared. Uh, we basically had to stop the airline. Yeah. And so what we found out is that you have to be extremely assertive in times of, you know, of major crisis. You, you, you cannot uh, wonder whether you're going to do this or you're going to do that. You have to make very rapid decisions, be very rational, and uh, very surprisingly, and, and I go back to what I call the speedboat effect, um, one of our best months in record was the month after the influenza crisis hit because it took us one day to stop our operation. It took the larger guys three weeks to stop yeah. our operation. Yeah. So by the time the larger guys were stopping, we were cranking it up again. Yeah. And we simply fill our aircraft with all of the pent-up demand, so. Oh. No, that's interesting for me. So you obviously we focused on the threats and on, on purpose I did that. And now I think it'd be great, Kevin, if you could talk about one of what I think is a great value creation opportunity for the airlines is how they manage their frequent flyer programs. And of course you have, through your partnership network, multiple frequent flyer programs. And they are a real driver of customer loyalty. There's no doubt about it that the, in, in the United States as an example, one of the big attractions for people flying on a particular airline is that they can take the family to Disney World or Hawaii on points afterwards, the same in Europe. And so having a very valuable frequent, or, or having a, a very attractive frequent flyer program definitely has a real benefit to the top line of the business. And I know you, you uh, bought the Air Berlin uh, frequent flyer program as well. So maybe you could give us your thoughts on how that drives your business. Yeah, sure. Um, there, uh, <laughs> There are 1,700 airlines, I think, in the world today. Um, and you know, given technology we have today, the consumer literally at the click of a mouse or you know, tapping on their smartphone at the latest app you know, has complete and perfect knowledge about what your product is, what your price is, what you're pricing your product at, as well as all your competitors. So as we've talked about, it, it's a, it's a hyper-competitive business. And frequent flyer programs are you know, a way to reward our guests uh, for the loyalty that they show the airline, and they're a key component of, uh, of, uh, of our top line revenue. Uh, but just like the airline business and all business, it's evolving. Um, those programs are evolving from very airline-centric programs to you know, broader uh, loyalty programs to what are you know, being called now lifestyle programs. Uh, and so in order for us uh, to really stay competitive and, uh, and innovative, we need to build on the great program that we have today with Eddie Hot Guests and really take that to the next level. And that's in part why you know, we've invested in, in some other programs. We have 70% of Air Berlin's program and, uh, and we'll have a percentage of some other programs as well. Uh, again, it's a, it's a business of scale. So you know, being able to provide that guest you know, service to where they want to go when they want to go there, but also reward them for their travel wherever that may be, whether it's you know on Etihad or on one of our partners. And rewarding them in a very innovative way, not just with airline miles, although that's the currency now, but really expanding how they can use that currency in a variety of different ways, whether it be air travel, whether it be purchase of goods and services, whether it be dining, you know, really creating. Uh, you know, a wide array of options to reward that guest uh, for, you know, for his uh, purchase of your product. Uh, and so we are, uh, we're very focused on that. We think there's great opportunity in that space. Uh, airlines that have, uh, have uh, moved in this direction have found a great deal of value in that space. And uh, so, you know, we're going to focus on that going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And Andre, one of the other things looking at the, uh, the MRO business that I think is a great benefit of outsourcing MRO is that a big leasing company or a big airline doesn't have to carry an enormous inventory of parts 
And of course, there's not just the obsolescence risk, but there's pilferage as well, holding big stores of parts. Um, how would you describe the benefits to the airlines of you holding the parts as opposed to the airlines holding the parts on their own balance sheet? You mean inventory, the large inventory. So you, you're going to have a big stock of inventory yeah. to overhaul engines, airframes, etc., rather than the airlines or the leasing companies owning it themselves. Yeah, I mean, uh, f f for me, um, it's, it's. I mean, we, we have we've been able to demonstrate in the past that uh, we focus on uh, optimization of inventory, network material availability, material supply owning inventory of 30, 40 airlines uh, makes, makes it easier to optimize than for a pure single airline if you have to make sure you've got all the material where you've got the risk of the, of the, of the write-off of the stock you've got there and then you never ever have the material at the, at the right location. So with someone who is focusing and having the, the full inventory of 30, 40 airlines and 60 uh, to 65 locations like, like we have got, we are probably in a better position to support and guarantee the availability um, of, of material. Um, I understand always the airline wants to keep it all close uh, and, and on site, but give you another example. In, in the past when they, everybody believed it's important to have it all on site, when the seasonal impact comes in, so let's say in January, February, March, they had number of aircrafts down, inventory was not. Uh, so what do they do with the, with the inventory? We move it, for example, into a total different region, to a total different customer, where it's a total different uh, seasonal impact, and they need higher material. So the optimization we've got is at a different level, and there's uh, someone with a very, very high inventory uh, to support and make sure the, the, the latest and greatest level of the parts is available. We have an interest of maintaining them also at the level where we can guarantee um, higher time on wing. We can also make sure that the disruption, because it's uh, to our disadvantage and to the, maybe the disadvantage of an airline, is maintained to a level where maybe 20% more reliability is on part. We've got less turns in our pool, but more important, uh, the disruption of the operation is not there. And then we focus on a total different st uh, step now because we think uh, the, the next level ahead, and which is do a, the maintenance in a, in a predictive and a preventive way because the data we've got also is from 30, 40 airlines. We know when parts fail in which region and why it makes sense maybe the night before even the part hasn't failed to take it already off because we know there is a potential risk for the airline that that part will fail. Mm -hmm. But this is what our focus and our core competence is, but not very often seen yet at the, at the airline level where I need to have the part there. It's a, it's a, it's a total different interest. And uh, I understand we need to be more convincing uh, stuff and actually to, to build the trust in, in every airline, but I believe there's this huge potential to create also the whole process lean, um, if you like, for, for an airline yeah. with the right partner again. Well, I think that's a great point, which is that you have so much information Yep. Um, about engine performance, airframe performance, Components that you performance. can see the problems before an airline can see them, given your knowledge and your experience. And of course, that's uh, something that'd be of tremendous value to the extent you can share it with your partners. But maybe before we wrap up, we've heard some of the, the issues with the airline business here over the course of the last 30 odd minutes. But you can't lose track of the fact that aviation is a true growth industry. Structurally, that is a given. In 10 to 15 years' time, twice as many people are going to travel as are traveling today. So if you're investing in this industry, there is tremendous opportunity and upside for those who can survive and thrive as the airline industry itself matures. It's still, you know, really, it's coming out, it's into its adolescence now and will move into its adulthood over the course of the next decade. And those who have the lean business models, the business models that can differentiate on the top line, can be focused on the customer. There is enormous opportunity because of the growth. You, one thing you know for sure in this industry, the growth is there. People are going to travel more as the global economy improves through emerging markets. Um, also, we just have even just a couple of percent growth 
in Western Europe and North America is a tremendous amount of seat miles that are required, particularly when you compound it. So maybe to close, if I could just get a minute off each of the panelists um, about what you feel over the course of the next 10 years are some of the, you know, maybe just one differentiating factor to make sure that you are going to be the airline or the MRO of the future. Well, in our case, the big problem, and I share your, vis your vision and it's a reality, but infrastructure needs to keep pace. Uh, we are based in an airport which is totally slot congested. Uh, we have uh, about 1,200 slots a week, which is a good quantity of slots, but if we would want to, let's say, expand or grow our fleet by even 10, 15 percent, we wouldn't have enough slots to do that. We would have to go elsewhere to try to, uh, to fly our aircraft, not where the demand is, because where the demand is, we're already congested. So our challenge, I believe, in order to, to, to materialize that vision, uh, absent in our case, in our part of the world, uh, of a platform for growth, is to simply increase the average departure per, uh, per uh, average aircraft uh, per departure, so that's the rationale behind our bringing uh, ATR 70 to 600, which is uh, 20 more seats per, per departure, and that's what the rest of the industry is doing as well. Um, as long as we don't have the platform for growth, it's going to be very difficult to achieve uh, a significant expansion. Hopefully the governments will, uh, will get their act together and have long-term visions as, as the airlines do. This is a long-term uh, business by definition, you know, by the time you, you've placed an order of aircraft, from the time you've done that till the implementation, maybe three, four years will have gone by. By that time, a new government will be in place, their vision will be different, and they will start from scratch. So that, to me, is the key challenge for the future. Right. And so that's infrastructure. Kevin, what would you say? Yeah, you know, I mean, success in the future, I think, is, is no different than success in the past. The speed at which you've got to move is, is, I think, just a little quicker. Uh, but, you, you know, you've got to innovate. You've got to understand who your market is. You've got to understand what they want. You've got to be able to deliver that better than your competition can and do it at the best possible cost so that there's value for the money. Um, I think that's always been true in business. It's true going forward. And the, and the carriers that can, you know, understand the, their guests the best, that can innovate the fastest, that can create that can break down some old paradigms and find new efficiencies, those are, those are the businesses, those are the airlines that are going to be most successful in the future. And Andre, what about yourself? What do you think in the MRO? What's going to be the differentiating factor? I mean, f first of all, I mean, uh, everybody proud on, on, on the success on the past. There's always a, a risk, something you need to take into account when you grow so fast, and, and that sort of additional growth is coming. For me, it's important that as an MRO, we contribute in a way that uh, it stays the sa safest way of traveling. Uh, make sure the technical part uh, doesn't damage anyway the, the reputation in the future, making sure uh, people are trained and, and qualified in a way to stay also innovative with innovative solutions for, for airlines. And uh, important for us to demonstrate a, a real added, added value, reducing cost and complexity for airlines. Thank you. Well, we're just about out of time. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you, the audience, uh, for, uh, for joining us here today. I hope you found it useful. I think we had a great discussion up here about the, uh, the risks and the opportunities that face the aviation industry. And thank you so much to our hosts, Mubadla, for putting on this premier event, which we all very much appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.